Do I need glasses today or not? I wonder. Let's see. I try and go without the glasses, me being the vain guy that I am. That's why I print up my notes, you know, in, in larger font, you know, so I could read them. So, But sometimes I use the reading glasses, sometimes I don't. We'll see what happens today. I don't know. Welcome. Welcome to Ask the Pastor. Another, another fine session, I trust. Are you ready to open in prayer? I'm ready to open in prayer. Father, thank you for... First of all, a great prayer time I was able to have tonight. Thank you for the day. Thank you for all the people that are tuning in live today. They're going to be participating. Thank you for all the people who are tuning in during the week, Lord God, to check out what happened on Tuesday night. God, I pray that everybody that needs to tune in will be tuning in. And you've always got something fresh, Lord God, if our hearts are open. Lord, thank you that, Lord, uh, um, the value of what we're doing can't be measured, Lord God, just by the content, God. You are able to take our five loaves and two fishes, God, and just do absolutely miraculous stuff with it. We trust you'll do that tonight as well, Lord, as we try to honor you by talking about your word and responding to whoever tunes in and asks the question in the comment section, God, this is your hour, God, and give it to you right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. How's it going? My wife, my daughter-in-laws, Amber and Christy, Amber is in Los Angeles, Christy is in Saskatoon. My daughter-in-laws would tell you that they have the best mother-in-law in the world. And my uh, wife, Heather, yesterday, she left to be with both of them, not at the same time, because they live in different places. Both of them, within the next two weeks or so, are giving birth to little boys. And my wife is going to be there to assist them, you know, in the first month or so, bringing home the little babies. And both of them have, you know, uh, children already. Christy's got a, I have a four-year-old uh, a granddaughter in Saskatoon. And I got a little almost two-year-old grandson in LA. So when you've already got kids, you know, bring the baby home. Heather knows where she needs to be. So uh, missing not having her around, but know she's where she needs to be. And then I'm joining them. I'm going to be uh, taking two weeks off in March after the boys are born. And I'm going to go see my new grandsons. And I'm counting the days. I can hardly wait. But we got to take care of business tonight, don't we? Okay. So here we go. Kirk is, you know, Kirk sent me another, oh, 200 questions or so, 150 questions or whatever to carry this show for, oh, another two, three months. And chances are, if Kirk continues his excellence, he'll be, uh, he'll be doing the, uh, Bringing more questions on here. The guy just cranks them out like crazy. And they're the best I've ever had for any Ask the Pastor show I've ever done. Uh, let's see what we got here. Community moderation. What's that? I wonder why that's on there. My comment section. I don't know why. Oh, there it is. Man, okay. If I do that. And then I do that. Ah, Facebook's changed it uh, output again. I've got a different... Uh, the comment section is different now. Weird. Okay. Anyway, 2 Corinthians 8.14. Are we to give to others without ever expecting to receive something back? Yeah. Yeah, we are. That's the goal. And uh, anytime you see something in the Bible that suggests, you know, you should do it and do it with your whole heart, you know, um, the wrong thing to do is to say, well, I, I can't do that. That's not me. That's just, you know, I'm no saint. I'm just a normal person. Don't ever react that way. 
react this way instead. Whoa, that's, hmm. Okay, God, help me. Whenever you ask God to help you, specifically and especially when it comes to being obedient to him, being what he's asked you to do in his word, whenever you ask him to help you, he's always going to help you. Always. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. Yeah. Give without expecting to receive something back. And in the Gospels, I think uh, uh, Jesus says, you know, everybody gives with something expecting back, but you're different, you know? He calls us to a higher, a higher plane. And, uh, you know, we espouse to that. And, and I wouldn't be in this whole thing if it wasn't for the fact that, that he helps you get there. Never ask you to do something that he's not willing to help you with. Always. And that's, boy, I'll tell you. That sets apart this walk with Christ different from anything else. Any other philosophy, any other religious way, any other lifestyle. When you've got Almighty God more than willing to empower and help you, boy, what more could you ask for? Next question, 2 Corinthians 8.24. Was the generous gift to the Jerusalem church the proof of the Corinthians' love? Um, I wouldn't say it's a proof, but I think it was a, a, a measuring stick, a good, accurate measuring stick. I think uh, that, you know, the Corinthian church had a bit of a reputation for being quite raucous and worldly and wild. And uh, I think that gift that's refer referenced in, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 24, I think it kind of blew people away. And it caused the apostles to kind of stand back and go, okay, this is, uh, God must be really doing something. You know, and I think it was an I think it was an accurate measuring stick, yeah, yeah. It was. I'm, I'm slow to say proof, you know, because there's a lot of things that, you know, it was uh, it was evidence that there was something very supernaturally real going on in that church. I'll say that. And if you want me to get more specific, that's what the comments section is for. Just type it in there. Did Solomon die in his sins or was he repentant? There is no evidence whatsoever that he repented. And 1 Kings uh, chapter 11 says that his wives led him astray. Okay, and there's no evidence that he got back to God. Yeah, he did not finish well at all. In fact, someday in Christ Church, I, I have a, I'm, I'm going to pull out a sermon. And it's called The Ignorance of Solomon. You know, everybody talks about the wisdom of Solomon. Yeah, well... He really didn't finish well at all. And he really, uh, um, you know, spiritually wet the bed. I mean, he did, what a mess, you know, what a, what a waste. So sad. If you read the Old Testament, man, the Old Testament is just an amazing record of, of really stupid, jerky people that God used and chose to do great things with. And uh, I'm telling you, Solomon's got to be one of the guys at the top of the list, you know, if you're into lists like that. David committed some horrible sins. But how do we know he was justified? Well, according to the Bible, the only horrible sin that he committed was Bathsheba. He did a lot of killing, but he was ordered by God to do that killing, okay? He was a warrior. He shed a lot of blood, but him shedding blood was... He was literally God's uh, instrument of judgment on wicked people. And the only sin that God seems to really have nailed him for, that God would turn for, was the whole affair with Bathsheba. Committing adultery with her and then trying to cover it up and lying and having her husband killed. And man, that's quite a story. Is faith alone sufficient for salvation? Hmm. If it's real, if it's real faith, yeah, that's all that's needed. But but real faith contains action. Real faith is not just, you know, agreeing with the truth. Uh, I think it's James 2.19 where it says that the, the demons believe and tremble. I mean, the, the demons agree that the Bible is true. They don't have faith because their actions do not line up with their belief. They don't live their lives like they do believe okay they agree with the truth there's a difference between agreeing with the truth and belief faith is something that you know and it can be measured by your actions you know 
I think it's James that says, you know, tell me, show me what you, you know, show me what you believe. I'll show you what I believe by what I do. You tell me what you believe. I'll show you what I believe by what I do. And that's, and he's, that's where in the book of James, he's the guy that said, that says, you know, faith without works is dead. That doesn't mean that works earned you salvation. Works is the evidence of how real your faith is. So if it's real faith, yeah, that's, that's all that's sufficient. Yeah. Because real faith is not just going to be satisfied with just believing the right stuff. It, it, it wants to engage. It wants to be productive. It wants to see the results and the power of that faith. Because it's real. That's real faith. Okay? Again, if I'm not explaining it up, that's what the comment section is for. And I remind, you know, when you tune in, that anybody that participates on the comment section, okay, your question and your comments, they get precedence. Okay? We give uh, immediate attention to uh, the comments. They take precedence over any uh, prepared questions we have for uh, the broadcast. Can we believe in Christ's finished work on the cross, yet live without visible proof of new birth and have confidence on Judgment Day? Um, I got to speak for myself, because that's a real personal thing. And I don't know if I would want to apply the way I judge myself to others. I could not, Kirk. Okay? I could not. I could not uh, 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 say that I believe in Christ without visible proof of the new birth. It would not give me confidence. To me, it's not enough. Just and We're on a bit of a theme here with the opening questions. I don't believe that faith is just believing truth. Okay? It affects your lifestyle. It affects your priorities. It affects your desires. It affects your relationships. It should, if it's real, it should affect everything. Okay? In Romans 5, Paul wrote that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What does that mean for us? What it means to me, and I think what it could mean to anybody, is that, that nothing I can do, the level of love that God has already demonstrated towards me, the level of love that God directs towards me in his desire to have a relationship with me, I could never earn it. There's nothing I could do in my actions, living a holy life or whatever, that could merit that level of love. Okay? What it says to us, what it means to me is, he doesn't love me because I've got my act together. When I was at my worst, when I was at my worst, when I was at my arrogant, self-entitled, hypocritical, spiteful, cynical, pessimistic worst, he loved me enough to die for me. And I think what it means to us is if I'm going to live a holy life and I'm going to be convinced, yeah, I want to serve Jesus. I want to live like him. I want him to be my role model. You don't do it because you're trying to earn his favor. You do it because you recognize how much he already loves you. That's a, a grace has been defined as unmerited favor. In other words, favor you don't deserve. And that's what Romans 5, 8 really means. While we were yet sinners, long before we ever decided to get our act together, he loved us enough to die for us. I think somebody who loves me that much is worth knowing. I think a relationship with that person is, is uh, worth any hassle or trouble I've got to get go through to get to. In fact, that's why Jesus said, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. I think he's, I think it's worth doing. I do. I'm sold on the product. <laughs> Does lack of visible evidence prove one is not born again? Um, I would say no, not for us, because only God knows the heart. You can't discern somebody's heart. You don't know what's going on in somebody's heart. And I want to give you a scripture on this one, because this one's I've used for other purposes, but I think it's, it's suitable for this one here. It's 2 Corinthians 10, 12. And Paul writes, says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Okay. And I think there's a bit of, you know, if I want to prove somebody's not born again, I'm comparing myself to them. That's not a healthy comparison. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Okay. Well, only God can. Okay. So I would say, uh, to close off the answer of the question, is to, is to live to please God and, and, and don't worry about performance. And don't worry about whether somebody's born again or not, you know. I got enough concerns with, you know, 
pursuing God myself to worry about whether somebody's born again or not. Now I'm in the position of a pastor where, um, you know, I'm responsible for people's growth. I, I'm God holds me responsible to a great degree for whether people are growing in their in their relationship with God or not. So I have to be concerned about that. And I think it's a good thing to be concerned if there's a real heart of love there. But if there's a heart of love, you know, like a, a, you're going to love unconditionally anyway, whether they're coming around or not. You know, we go back to that uh, scripture, uh, uh, Kirk, you pointed out in Romans 5. I mean, Jesus loved us while we were yet sinners. And, and that's what compels us to love our enemies, to love the world, not the things of the world, but to love people who are sinners. Jesus was a friend of sinners. He's our role model. So we be, we make friends with sinners. You know, we let sinners know by our actions that they're genuinely loved. And it's not, no strings attached. Uh, most of the motivation of our evangelism, the target of our evangelism in Christchurch is downtown, people that are poor, people that can't pay back, people that will never you know, they're not the type of people that typical churches are going after, okay? And um, our mission is to love people, whether they come around or not, whether they accept our message or not, they're going to know they're loved. They're going to know they're loved, okay? And uh, you don't worry very much about whether somebody's born again or not, if you really, really love them, because your love for them, it doesn't depend on whether they're coming your way or not. You love people. And I think that's probably the greatest evidence that Jesus Christ has come into your life. How much you love people. Next question. If we believe Christ died for us, do any of our other beliefs matter? Um, well, sure they do. I mean, uh, um, yeah, I mean, when you come to Christ, it's the beginning. The fear of God, and when I don't mean, you know, fear of God in that we, it's the Hebrew word for fear is that awesome respect for God, where you realize he really is who he says he is. And there's a reverence there, that, that profound reverence for God that leads us to accept him as, as, our, as our Lord and our Savior, okay? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the start. And Proverbs says, in all you're getting, get understanding. Paul said to, to Timothy, Timothy could have been, you know, satisfied with, uh, you know, just his belief in God. But, but Paul told Timothy, you know, study to show yourself approved. He told, uh, you know, his other followers, contend. He uses the term contend for the gospel. Know your stuff, you know. Don't just espouse right beliefs. Live it, you know. Um... And Hebrews 6.12 says that laziness robs us of the inheritance that is rightfully ours. So, yeah, your, your other beliefs matter. Now, what are other beliefs? Now, you haven't defined them, Kirk, but I'm going to interpret your question as best I know how. And if I'm not cutting it, you know, you could put it on the comment section if, I'm, if I got it misread it anyway. What are our other beliefs? What are our beliefs about, uh, um, you know, you said if we believe Christ died for our sins, what about other beliefs? Well, I believe also that the Bible is the Word of God. I believe that what it teaches, it's true. I believe that uh, it's the it's the smartest way to live, and the and the and the most blessed way to live, and the and the most productive way to live. Okay, um, yeah, I believe Jesus died for us. Yeah, I believe He's the only begotten Son of God. Yeah, my faith and trust is in Him, but the Bible is is just a treasure trove of wisdom. Okay, and um, it describes itself. And it, man, I would. Totally agree. The unsearchable riches of God's word. What does it mean, unsearchable? Does that mean you can't find it? No, it means it's you, you never get to the bottom of it. Uh, my father uh, read the Bible through cover to cover 59 times before he died. He, he, he was younger than me when he died. And, um, you know, I learned very early in life, and he was a, the best living testimony of anybody I've ever known. That reading it over and over and over, it's never repetitive. It's always fresh. It's always alive. There's always new insights. God's always revealing, you know, powerful, wonderful stuff to you. I mean, I find that I'm only going through. I think I'm going, and I, I guess I was raised in a, in a in an environment where it's a good thing to keep track of of you know and to systematically read the Bible. And I'm going through it for. I keep forgetting whether it's the 16th time or the 17th time or the 15th time. I got it written here. What am I going through the Bible for? How many times here? 
I know some of you could care less about this, but I want to know, so I'm looking at it. Okay, yeah, I'm going through for the 16th time. And people that don't know how powerful the Bible is and how it's the Word of God, it's the only book that reads you, okay? Um, you know, they might think, man, how can you do that? Like, it's just, it's the same old. No, it's never same old. Never same old. It's new all the time. It's alive. John, John you know, uh, Hebrews says that the Word of God is alive and active. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I proved that over and over, okay? So I'm not just going to settle for, you know, uh, yeah, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Are you kidding me? He's given me his word, basic instructions before leaving earth, man. I want everything I believe to be affected by the most amazing letter from Almighty God to his creation, okay? In fact, it is the source that reveals his power and source that reveals what he's like more, more that's more reliable than anything else. Havana, Pastor John, you are the best. She's my buddy. Question, do prophets exist today? And what about speaking in tongues? Some people say spiritual gifts are no longer available to believers. Okay, you got about three or four comments there. I'm going to comment on each one. Question, do prophets exist today? Um, I believe they do. Um, if you understand what a New Testament prophet is, and it doesn't disagree with Old Testament prophets, uh, prophets declare truth. Okay, and prophets have a passion for declaring truth. Prophets do not care whether the declaration of that truth lands them in jail. They don't care about the consequences of revealing truth. They don't care too much about what anybody thinks either. Okay, and that's the downside of a prophetic gifting. Um, often they predict the future. Um, if they predict the future and it doesn't happen, then they're not a prophet. Okay, and uh, um, and there's a lot of phony prophets around, but I think they still exist. In my experience. If somebody is going around telling you he's a prophet or he declares himself a prophet, in my in my experience, they're usually a phony. 99% of the time, they're phonies. They're just arrogant, misled people who want attention, okay? The real prophets I've seen, and I would say are genuine, they cringe at the thought of being called a prophet. They have so much respect for the office and so much uh, respect for God that they would never declare themselves prophetic. But God keeps using them and using them and using them in that area. Okay, that's my personal experience with people that are have that prophetic gifting. And yes, I believe prophets are still, uh, I think they're still valid for a day. But speaking in tongues, I, I speak in tongues every day. Spoke in tongues today. I was praying with uh, my brother, Asufu. You know, our leader's prayer meeting is Tuesday night. And I was speaking in tongues. Uh, there's some people you say in your comments, some people say that spiritual gifts are no longer available to believers. I really feel sorry for them. <laughs> I mean, man, yeah, like, uh, I really think they're limiting God. Who are they to say? It says in, in First and I know in the scripture that they're referring to. In fact, maybe we should look at it. Because in my opinion, they're misinterpreting 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 14 out of, uh, out of fear. Okay? And it says that... Uh, uh, It says that knowledge shall cease, and uh, no, it says that tongues shall cease, and uh, 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 all these gifts will cease. Well, you know, knowledge hasn't ceased. Where does it say, uh, 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 it doesn't say that these things are going to, all the, anyway, I, I really think it's a misinterpreted scripture to, to, to suggest that uh, uh, um, these gifts have, uh, um, You know, these gifts have ended. i got to find that scripture. I'm sorry I can't. Uh, uh, I don't have the. Um... Okay, I just saw it here. Okay. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Okay? Now, some people interpret that as, you know, these giftings are going to cease. Well, has knowledge passed away? No. Maybe someday, according to what Paul's writing here, you know. Um, prophecies? Uh, yeah. You know, compared to love, but what he's trying to say is love's going to endure more than anything. Knowledge and tongues and prophecies, they're, I don't see any evidence that they've ceased at all. Okay? And, and usually the people that are attacking those supernatural gifts, um, you know, they get really, really nervous when those gifts are in use. 
And they will often, I've, I've heard preachers, you know, even attribute uh, speaking in tongues and, and prophecies as demonic, you know, and I, and, and I st step back and go, whoa, pump the brakes there, pal. Easy, you know. You don't want to be going across the line there. You you got to have a lot. You got to be all knowing to be able to make a declaration like that. Okay, you're in denial of uh, of, of a person's of the word of God that says the heart is deceitful above all things. Who are you to be able to discern the the, the intents of the heart? Only God can do that. Okay. And I speak in tongues all the time. I've seen. I've been. I've been in services where. Uh, um, Firsthand, I, I, I've heard people speaking in tongues where they're speaking actual languages that they've never learned before, okay? One was Hungarian, one was uh, 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 Spanish, uh, spoken in the Caballero province of Spain, and the other was Parisian French, okay? And the three times I've witnessed those things, the people who were speaking never, were, never, said, never learned a word in those languages, and yet they were speaking them perfectly, not only eloquently, but with the accents as well. So tongues isn't just gibberish, although most of the time it is. And according to the book of Acts, that's what it is. Because it's they said these people sound like they're drunk. So, you know. Um, and, and I've heard people get hung up. Well, it's not real unless it's a real language. Well, how do you know? You know, it's a heavenly language. Paul said, I pray with the spirit and I pray with the understanding. What's the difference between the two? It's obvious. One he understands, the other he doesn't understand. Why doesn't he understand? Because He's speaking in tongues, you know. In fact, he even told the church in Corinth when he was rebuking them for the abuse of the gift, he said, I'm glad that I speak in tongues more than you all. It's good enough for Paul. It's good enough for me. Good question, man. Hmm. Does merit have anything to do with our salvation? No, none but it certainly has everything to do with productivity. It has everything to do with rewards. It has everything to do with, uh, um, I think it can be a accurate measuring stick of how valid and how alive your relationship to Jesus is. Okay? Again, by your fruits, you'll know them. If there's no fruits, that means you're not being productive. If there's no fruit, then I question whether the relationship is, is real. What do I mean by fruit? Well, there's our lives are productive. People are being impacted positively because of uh, the Spirit of Christ in our life. There's more light in our lives than there is darkness. There's more truth than there is falsehood. Okay? That's productivity. That's growth. Jesus cursed a fig tree because it wasn't producing fruit like it's supposed to. And the, and the illustration is, is very clear. And it was clear to the disciples, too. He expects us to be productive. You know? Hey, he, Jesus knows how much our salvation cost, okay? Jesus knows the price that he paid. And I think it's very, very appropriate for Jesus to expect, hey, I gave you the most supernatural, productive, wonderful gift that's ever been bestowed upon mankind. I think it's fair for him to expect a bit of a return, okay? Just my opinion. We aren't saved by being married. Oh, but sometimes it could feel like it. <laughs> That's my italics added there. Uh, we aren't saved by being married, so we can't lose our salvation by getting remarried after divorce, correct? Wow, never saw it worded like that, but Kirk, you are you come up with stuff, man, that I've never encountered before, and that's why I love your questions. Um, I'm going to read it to you again because, you know, there's some thought here. It's a good question. We aren't saved by being married. So we can't lose our salvation by getting remarried after a divorce, correct? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you marry somebody who's divorced, you've committed adultery. Now, that's not just a singular um, scripture that talks about that topic. There are a number of things that, that Paul and, and, the, and Jesus say about adultery, okay? For instance, uh, uh, divorce, it, 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 divorce, he says, is, uh, it, it, it's permittable with, uh, uh, if, there's, if there's marital unfaithfulness. What's marital unfaithfulness? It's adultery. Adultery is a sin. Any way you cut it, okay? Any kind of sex outside of marriage without a license is sin. And um, it does say if you marry somebody who's divorced, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's, a, that's, that's adultery too. 
Now, how do you apply marital unfaithfulness to that? I don't know. He's the judge, okay? I, I, I think it's safe to say this, though. As much of that adultery is a sin and you can't get around it, it's not the unpardonable sin. Jesus forgives. There's one unpardonable sin, and there's not too many theologians that have even figured out what that is. It's called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and you're going to have so many opinions on what that means, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, I know one thing for sure. Adultery is not the unpardonable sin. Jesus forgives. God forgives. The sin has been atoned for if we ask him to forgive. And, you know, and, and critics will say, well, that's just you're using the blood of Christ as a license to sin. Yep, people do. Doesn't change the fact that his forgiveness covers all sin. If we're repenting and we if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart and he's the one that judges the intents of the heart and he's the only one that can, the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? But you can't call something a sin that the Bible says is sin. And, and adultery is one of those things where it's in a lot of places. Okay? It's not just one little isolated scripture. It's a sin. Again, we could, if you want to dialogue on this in the comment section, feel free. Okay? And that's that's one of them, boy, I've had hours and hours and thousands of hours maybe well, at least hundreds hundreds of hours of discussion on that with people is eastern orthodoxy as bad as roman catholicism what is their salvation based on well I, i'm not i'd be slow to say they're you know both are bad i mean there's roman catholics and there's orthodox people they're not bad at all they love jesus christ and they're born again i think that you know there's like there's a lot of flaws in those denominations just like there's flaws in every denomination um you know uh i would ask the question if it if a, if a system of belief is good as bad good or good or bad what is their salvation based on is it really based on are they are they effective in communicating that's only through grace that we are saved by the blood of christ or is there works uh personally i i i, I like the eastern orthodox you know denomination better um but god's their judge um, uh, Michael Heiser, and, uh, you know, if you go on YouTube and just type in Michael S. Heiser and then type in, in quotation marks, which religion is right, he does about a 10 to 20 minute talk that is so good. And uh, in that talk, I, I obviously don't have it memorized, but, but he says, uh, um, you know what, any faith that is preaching that Jesus Christ is the only son of God and the only way to salvation is through him is the gospel and it's measured by how much how clear the gospel is and he also makes the statement he says he says i've seen roman catholic and eastern orthodox and coptic even coptic that's egyptian orthodox okay i've seen them i've seen dead churches and i've seen alive churches and the catholic and orthodox churches that are alive are the churches that haven't lost their fire for evangelism they haven't lost their fire for preaching the gospel that Jesus Christ has died for your sins and you can be forgiven and you can be in heaven and you can live a new life in Christ because of what Jesus has done if you'll accept him as Lord and Savior. And believe it or not, there are, you know, what we would describe often as nominal Christian faiths, you know, traditional Christian faiths that have kind of lost the edge, lost the fervor. But within some of those faiths, boy, there's some leaders that have not lost it. And they still cling to the word of God and they still preach the gospel. And it makes a difference right there. It really does. Paul talked about it a little bit. I think he alluded to it in Philippians 1, where he says, you know, some preach for dishonest gains. Some preach, you know, like, and, and he says, I rejoice no matter what their motives are, that the gospel is being preached. And I've used this illustration often because, uh, you know, I've had the question often on, on Ask the Pastor, well, what about all these televangelists? You know, they're nothing but crooks and all they care about is money. You know, and I've met people who, you know, are big fans of these guys because they came to Christ. They are legitimately born again. They heard the gospel from Kenneth Copeland or Benny Hinn or Kenneth Hagin or, or Joel Osteen or, or, or uh, Bob Tilton. You know, I just named off four names of, of four of the preachers that I can't watch them. I, I just, I think they're full of crap, okay? I think they're greedy. I think they're misled. I, I don't mean to judge. I reserve the right to be wrong. Okay, if I'm wrong, I hope I am. But personally, I, I don't see them emphasizing 
you know, what I see in the Bible, they need to be emphasizing, okay? And again, that's just pure opinion. Reserve the right to be wrong. But I rejoice because the gospel is so powerful. The gospel is so supernatural. It can, still, it can even transform people's lives when it's being communicated by jackasses. And I put myself in the category of jackasses, okay? And God... God has to use imperfect people because all the perfect ones are dead and we're all he's got. So we're going to keep pursuing Jesus. We're going to do our best to be Christ-like and not to say and do things that detract from the message, but to remind us again and again, it's not us. It's the power of the gospel. Okay? It's foolishness to the Greeks, a stumbling block to the Gentiles, but to us, it's the power of salvation. I really like Michael Heiser, the Bible teacher. Some of the teachers I've loved over the years, uh, you may not know all these all these names, uh, John Wesley, whom I'm named after, um, Jack Hayford, um, Martin Luther. Um, but my faith is not in John Wesley or Martin Luther. My faith is in one person. One person, Jesus Christ. And that makes all the difference in the world. And to the degree that any leader, any Christian is Christ-like, to me, that's the measuring stick. Okay, That's the authentic measuring stick. And none of us measure up. But you know what? If you're going to have a role model, he's the ultimate role model. He is. And, and I said earlier in the broadcast, the, the best thing about having Christ as the role model is that he actually helps us in our in our weaknesses he says in john 15 5 apart from me you can do nothing i'm the vine you're the branches so i want to stay hooked into that vine okay i don't want to stray okay because he's my everything he's my hope and as long as i'm connected with him boy i'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna be okay it may go through hell may go through pain he himself promised in john 16 33 in this world you will have trouble but be of good cheer i've overcome the world okay you can't avoid all the pain, but I'll tell you, if you follow Christ, you can you can avoid a lot of it. In fact, I, I would say you can avoid mo you can avoid most of it. Please explain John one four. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Well, I think it uh, it uh, lines up with when Jesus said, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life." He's just not the creator of life; he is life. He's the vine; we're the branches. There's another illustration of it. If you don't have Christ, you're in darkness. You can be a multi billionaire. You can have you know, a, a perfect health. You can have everything going, okay? If you don't have Christ, you're naked and blind. You have nothing. You are Colossians describe you as being, you're dead. You're not even alive. You're dead in your sins without Christ. Stark terminology. I didn't make it up. But I read it in that book that I said, I don't just read, it reads me. And it's alive. And I believe it with everything that's in me. Are there any Christian denominations that believe and teach the Bible as inerrant, yet teach some parts of it are fallible? What do Anglicans teach about this topic? Um, you know what? I'm, I i don't keep up on, you know, who thinks it's infallible, who thinks it's inerrant. And uh, um, my understanding of Anglicans, you know, before they, you know, they had the great schism in Canada, at least, where they decided to embrace same-sex marriage and uh, decided to interpret the Bible with their own private interpretation instead of believing it, you know, what it says. Um, you know, before that happened, in their catechisms and in their statement of faiths, they believed it was uh, uh, inerrant, but since then, by their practice, it's... Now, the, the breakaway Anglican Church, of which uh, um, uh, in, in Ottawa, we've got uh, uh, St. Peter and St. Paul's Anglican Church, and we've got Church of the Messiah. Both those churches are breakaway. Um, they broke away from the um, Anglican Church of Canada over this whole uh, um, biblical thing here. And I know for a fact that they, they believe that the Bible is the inherent word, inherent word of God, and it's not fallible. Um, the rest of the denominations, man, there's 55,000 of them, Kirk, so <laughs> I can't keep up with all the, <laughs> you know. Sorry. As Protestants, 
He starts off the question with that line, as Protestants. Yeah, I kind of bristle at that. You know, do I want to be known as a guy who protests? That's at the core of Protestantism. We protest. Our identity is found that we protest at the Catholic Church. My identity is in Jesus. I don't want to be called a Protestant. I want to be called a follower of Christ. If you want to call me that, that's your business. But, man, I don't want to be known as somebody who just has his identity from protesting. You know? Anyway, I might be straining in a gnat and swallowing camels here, but I don't know. i got to be honest. You know, I don't, I don't like that term. As Protestants, you know what? I'm going to change the wording here, Kirk. And if you if I if you if I if you don't like me doing that, let me know. But I'm going to change the wording to as followers of Jesus, should we be concerned with which denomination we belong to? Now that's a good question. Should I be concerned with denomination we belong to? Um, I think we should be a, a concerned with who we are accountable to. You know who we believe you know, uh, is as close to the biblical ideal as you can get, given our human fallibility. Um, I want to be a part of a group that's got a good track record of loving God with all their heart, soul, and mind, loving their neighbor as their self. I want to be involved with a group that, you know, takes the Great Commission seriously, go in all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, teach them to obey. Um, I want to belong to a group that cherishes the wisdom taught in the Bible. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of groups like that. I was born and raised in, in uh, the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. Um, I've been part of the Foursquare Gospel Church of Canada now for five years. And as far as doctrine and practice is concerned, the two denominations that I just described are almost identical. And uh, I, I think that any group of people that comes together to worship God is never going to be perfect, but the Bible says, if any two or three are gathered by name, his literal presence is in the midst there. And that gives me great hope. I enjoy my fellowship and who I'm accountable to. I enjoy the brothers and sisters God has provided me with in his church, okay? But when it comes right down to it, you're never going to find a perfect church and and but because my eyes are on Jesus, that doesn't bother me. Because uh, I know that if I'm following Christ and if his love is in me, I can, that imperfect church that he puts me in, that imperfect family he places me in, if I'm really following Jesus, I can make that group better. I can. Okay? The power of the Spirit of God that wants to rest on all of us makes us capable of loving better makes us more generous, makes us more patient. You know, it does wonderful Christ-like things to us that other people need, okay? They, the power of the Holy Spirit that's flowing within us, other people need to have that in, our, in their lives, and we need to be sharing it. God's Spirit was never poured out so that we would hoard it, okay? It's there to, uh, to be spilled out on others. Philippians 2.12. Please explain the second half of this verse, okay? Now, it says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean? Well, um, it says work out, not work for. In other words, you've given your life to Christ. Whether you know it or not, the Holy Spirit's come into your life, and you have got supernatural power that you don't even know you have access to. And he wants you to exercise it. wants you to work out. Flex your spiritual muscles. Get out and start doing stuff that you can only do because of the Holy Spirit is upon you. Don't get lazy. Expect us to bear fruit. That's what working God our salvation is. And I love to use the illustration of Wayne Gretzky, who there's no question, greatest hockey player that ever lived. He was a born, he was born athlete. But his dad knew it's not going to be enough, buddy. And his dad drilled him and put um, disciplinary um, um, principles in his life where Wayne Gretzky and every team he was ever on, he was always the first one on the ice and the last one off. He was practicing, practicing, practicing all the time. Guy was shooting 300 to 500 pucks a day when he was like six, seven, eight years old. Okay. Why? Working out, working out. And I've known enough, you know, professional athletes that, you know, they do things on the field and on the ice that, you know, 
I have to think about when I play those sports. I got to concentrate. They've done it so often. They've worked it out so much that it's like second nature to them. It's like breathing. I'll give you an illustration. This might not, you, know, you may not get this, but it, it means a lot to me because um, um, this is the first winter because I, I've got to get my hips replaced, okay? And, and the pain, I'm in constant pain all the time. And uh, this is the first winter in 54 years I haven't played hockey. Now, I'm not that good a hockey player, but I have learned some things. One of the things they taught us, you know, from when I was a kid, keep your head up, keep your head up, keep your head up, okay? You don't keep your head up, you're going to get creamed. And if you're a, a novice hockey player, when you're stick handling, you've got your eye on the puck because you don't want to lose the puck, okay? And in the last five or six years, I've learned better how to stick handle and handle the puck while my head is up, okay? And it was a mental block that um, never would have come had I not practiced, okay? Drumming is another skill that I do, okay? I I love drumming, and I've learned how to drum and because, you know, I can sit down and I can make you dance, man. I can get behind a drum, drum kit, and I can I can get the whole crowd going just by, why? Because I, I put in thousands of hours behind a drum kit. Okay, and uh, and I'm not naturally I'm not a naturally gifted hockey player. I'm not a naturally gifted drummer, but both those things I enjoyed so much. It was a joy to work out. It was a joy to practice. In fact, practice. I never thought of practicing drumming as practicing. I was always having fun, just enjoying myself. And in the in and in the process of enjoying myself and trying new things and working at things, you get better. And I think that principle is in place in Philippians 2.12. We come to Christ. We're learning how to follow Christ. And as you learn, as you grow, as, you be, as, as more of Jesus takes over your life, as you become more consumed in your love with him, as you follow him, you know, when you hang around people, you start turning into them. You start becoming like them. You start adapting their priorities. Okay, and the same thing with Christ. You hang out with Jesus, you start becoming like him. Okay, that's working out working out okay you work out your salvation you flex those powerful wonderful spiritual muscles that you don't know how powerful they are until you you know start exercising them man i want to go upstairs and drum right now where i'm doing this broadcast my drums are right above up on the room right above me i've got this uncontrollable urge just to sit down with that kit and just go bang 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 but i've got seven or eight people living in my home right now and they would I'll be um, trying to kill me within two minutes. Ah, <laughs> uh, dear. Next question. Please explain Philippians 2.17. Mainly the part about the drink offering. Okay, here's Philippians 2.17. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Life, okay, what, what does that mean? He's being poured out like a drink offering. Okay, a drink offering, when they did sacrifices in the New, in the Old Testament, if they were sacrificing a lamb, okay, you would, you would, well, the lamb would be sacrificed, and, and uh, but the priests and uh, what was left over, they were able to eat the meat, okay? They got the benefit of that sacrifice. A drink offering was not the same. A drink offering was poured on the altar. You don't get to drink it, Okay. The only drink, that nobody gets any return back from the drink offering. That is purely given to God. And what Paul is saying, you know, um, um, I'm not getting any benefit from this, okay? It's purely for Jesus. And his life is being spent for Christ and for them, okay? And he's rejoicing at that. He's not complaining. He's saying it's great. I think he's lately saying that I'm not getting out of nothing out of this, but it doesn't matter. Because the joy of knowing that, you know, um, 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 I get to do this for Jesus. And, and this is coming from a guy who's got a beautiful relationship with Christ, okay? This guy knows God. People that don't know God, they don't talk like that. They don't write like that. And, and Paul had a profound, unselfish, beautiful relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? That resulted in unbelievable productivity for the kingdom of God. That resulted in, in him being martyred as well, you know? for his faith, which is sad, but, you know, um, that's why he's listed as one of the heroes. He's one of the heroes of the faith, no question. Should our life's goal be to give glory to God? 
Um, if you ever get to know God, it will be. You know, if you're just a Christian saved by grace, that thought's not even going to cross your mind. You're just kind of doing your best and you want to do what's right. But man, if you ever get to know God, you will fall in love with him and you will be consumed with how wonderful it is to belong to God that everything you do, you will want to give glory to God. And that's not something you could decide to do. The only way that happens is you grow in your relationship with the Lord and you find out firsthand how wonderful it is to belong with him, belong to him. You can't fake that, okay? And uh, um, it's all I care about anymore. Maybe it's because I've made so many mistakes and maybe it's because I've, I've, I've seen how futile life is without Jesus. I've seen how futile church life is without Jesus. I've seen how futile religion is without Jesus. And Christ gives life to everything. And all he's asking is, hey, you know what? Just let me come in. Let me have my way. Let, let me show you what I can do. Okay? And he says that about your job. He says that about your marriage. He says that about your finances. He says that about your church, your family, everything in your life, your future, your the 24 hours that you're going to have in the next 24 hours. That's what it means when it says he stands at our heart's door knocking, wanting to come in. He says, hey, let, let, just follow me here. And the opposite is also true. In Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. And we think we're so right. You know what? You don't know how wrong you are until you have Christ come in to show you what being right is. Because he's at a level of righteousness and rightness that no human could ever reach. And yet he wants us to experience it. That's why he died on the cross. That's why, that's why he wants to have this relationship with us. Because he loves, you know, I love thrilling my kids and my grandkids. Our Father, our Heavenly Father's like that. He loves thrilling us. He wants to show us stuff. But he never forces himself. Knocks. Hey, let me come in. What does it mean to invite him in? It just means, okay. God, I don't understand it all, but I want you in my life. I want you ruling my life. Oh, my goodness. Smartest thing you could ever do. Most productive, blessed thing you could ever do is simply say, okay, God, I don't want to run my life anymore. I want you to run it. Show me how to do it. You keep praying that and living that way, man. You, have, you will be a living example of Christ saying, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. In other words, enjoying it so much, you you, there are times when you have to step back and say, "Whoa, I, this is just too good for me. This is amazing." Is faith a gift or a response? Hmm. I think it can be both, and I think it can be separate. I think there's the gift of faith where some people have a gift of faith where they, they just have a an uncanny ability to believe no matter what the circumstances. And other people, it's general faith where they have faith enough to believe that Jesus is the way. Um, I think faith can be a response in that you hear the word um, and, and you believe it. You know, how are they going to believe if they don't hear? Well, people hear and they believe. It's, it's a response. So there's, there's I, that's a good question. A, I think there's both elements there. I don't think it has to be either or. But sometimes it is either or. Not always. Jansen. Oz has contributed. Faith is also an obedience. I think I don't think faith is obedience. I think obedience is evidence of the quality of your faith. I think the level of obedience is, that tells you whether it's real or not. I think there's weak faith that doesn't have much obedience to it. <laughs> you know? But who am I to judge? God knows the level better than anybody does. But I think, as you're bringing up a good a good point, though, okay? Um, that's a very accurate measuring stick. Obedience is, is probably the best measuring stick of what faith is. I don't, I don't think I don't think the two are synonymous, but obedience is evidence of, of how good the faith is. Again, reserve the right to be wrong on that. Does prayer give God glory? 
Is prayer a form of worship? Does prayer give God glory? Is prayer a form of worship? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think any increased connection you have between you and God is always good. And I think it's, um, you know, just because we're glorifying God doesn't mean we're not getting any benefit out of it. I mean, if you're glorifying God, you're uh, you're you're becoming more aware of His presence. That's why worship is so important. We don't worship God because He wants. Yeah, He wants to be worshipped, but He doesn't need to be worshipped. He was doing quite fine before I got here around and got here, and He's going to be doing quite fine after I'm gone. So why do we worship? Well, because worship is a way for me to experience God, how wonderful and how great He is when I'm in His presence. When God is being glorified, yeah, we benefit from it. Yeah, it's great. Prayer is a form of worship. Yeah, I think anything can be worship, though. I base that on Colossians 3.17, where it says, whatever you do, do to the glory of God. So anything you do can be an act of worship when it's God. You know, let me be aware of your presence. Be pleased with what I'm doing here, you know? What is your, we're going to, we, should we close with this one? We might close with this one, depending on how long the answer is. What is your opinion of Bethel Church and Bill Johnson? Okay, Bill Johnson is, Bethel Church is a, a church in Redding, California, which is about 100 miles north of Sacramento. And um, they've had uh, a supernatural, um, it's a supernatural, they've had a, a supernatural, should I say supernatural? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that. A supernatural growth there where they've, it's turned into a mega church. I always get nervous when I see churches becoming mega churches because, man, there's there's always ego that gets in there. And mega churches almost always fall somehow. And uh, what's my opinion of him? Well, I, he puts his pants on like anybody else does. He probably farts daily, too. Um, um, without Jesus, Bill Johnson is nothing, of course, in, according to John 15, 5. Um, but I rejoice that the gospel's preached. Um, I've read a lot of the stuff and heard a lot of the stuff. And, and, you know, I know he's got his critics, but I kind of like the guy. I don't mind him at all. Most of the stuff I'm reading and, 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 and seeing is good. And I know that, uh, you know, whenever you're in the public eye, whenever you get preaching, people are going to pick your part of stuff pop pick apart your stuff they're gonna ride on stuff that they don't like that's just human nature okay i mean <sighs> sofi stadium in los angeles california okay it's the most expensive stadium that's ever built five billion dollars it's the home of the los angeles chargers and the los angeles rams and all kinds of other activities down there well i've been visiting los angeles now for 10 years because that's how long my son's been down there and, you know, I remember when they, because the land, you could see it when you fly into the L.A. airport. It's quite easy to see the land that, that the SoFi Stadium was there. And I remember seeing the progress of that stadium. It took, oh, from the time they broke ground, probably four or five years. That is a brilliant stadium. When you're done watching this broadcast here, go on YouTube, type in S-O-F-I, SoFi Stadium, and watch a video on how amazing that stadium is. Unbelievable. If you're a fan of architecture, it is state-of-the-art, man. It took five years from breaking ground till they opened that thing up. Why? Because it's five billion bucks. Hundreds and hundreds of architects worked on it. Engineers, construction people, probably 50,000 people put that thing up there. Five years. Okay? A lot of work. It's a lot of work to build up. It's a lot of work to construct something like that. You know, with, uh, oh, not too many... You know, with a, a demolition expert, um, you know, placing the right charges into that stadium, you could bring that entire stadium down and probably a skillful demolitions expert could bring that entire stadium down with his team, uh, probably take them a day, four to six hours, okay? Why is that? Because any idiot can tear down. It takes skill. It takes patience to build up. So when I'm asked to, what do you think of certain preachers? It's easy as anything to pick apart, okay? It's a different thing entirely, though, to, you know, to build something up. Oz has uh, got a lot. Faith is also being, believe on the name of Jesus Christ. He commanded it. That's true. 
And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us the commandment. Yeah. I don't see the word faith there, though. I see belief. Starts with belief. Belief is agreed. Faith is, is, is it starts with belief, but, but real faith is something that grows. Yeah, it could be a supernatural gift, but he says, look it, this is the way it is, and yeah, he commands it. Thanks, Oz. Appreciate it. Oz, if it's, if, if it's the Oz, I think it is. Oz is joining us from BC. Where are you joining us from? I can put in the comment. But we're out of time. Tomorrow night's our prayer meeting and Bible study. Street prayer meeting and Bible study at the Bible House, downtown, 315 Lisker. Join us. Thursday night's party night, soup night. Oh, I'd love to volunteer. Can we help you out? Yes. You know what you do? You come downtown because we got, you know what, we got all the cooks we got and, and we're, you know, setting up tables, cleaning up and everything, you know, setting up the clothes, the food and everything. We don't need your help. Not with that, but we need your help. You know what we need? We need you to come down every Thursday night for the next six months and just hang out with us and love people. This is what ministry is, okay? Feel around somebody's life until you find a crack. And then you pour the love of God in. And if people know they're loved, they will accept Christ far faster than the best sermons I could ever preach or the best presentations of the gospel I could ever do. Presenting the gospel is important. Of course it is. But I don't know anybody that ever accepted Christ and grew, grew, okay, that didn't have a lot of love involved, okay? We're called to love. Most important commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we give you, we offer you a wonderful opportunity to be a beat to God. You come downtown, hang out with us, have a good time, and it's like a party. You will love it, okay? And uh, nobody's ever going to come to Jesus unless the love of God. You see, we we reveal Christ. We, we demonstrate. Uh, I think Christ is revealed when you demonstrate his love, okay? So come down Thursday night and hang out with us, have some fun with us. And if you're more into the church thing, and what we do on Sunday is is kind of the church thing, but it's really weird. Anybody that comes, they'll, they they say, well, that's not like what I've had before, but they like it, okay? And we like it. And it's not because we're cool, it's because we're doing church right and everybody else is doing it wrong. That's that's not it at all. When Christ Church started six years ago, we had a bunch of people, about two or three dozen people that were so broken and so uh, um, dependent on God that we said, okay, God, if you want us to start a church, you better be here, because if you're not, we don't want to go. We've got no time for same old, same old. We've got no time for what we've already experienced. We want, we want you, God, nothing else. Nothing else. And that's all we got. That's all we got to offer. So you could show up Sunday night, and all the addresses and times are on the Facebook page there. You could show up Sunday afternoon and think, oh, I'm never coming back here again. Great. Well, at least you experienced it, or you could come, and you may think this is the greatest thing in the world. And if I got to sell you on the idea, well, I find that any, you know what you do when you have a product that's really lousy? You market the daylights out of it. So we don't market, we don't advertise or anything like that. We just love Jesus and let him do his thing. Let's pray. Father, like we pray so often, Lord God, on Tuesday nights, we're praying it again, God. Whatever was of you tonight, Lord, let it stick to us like glue. Let it equip us. Let it empower us. Let it make a difference in our lives and in the lives, Lord, of people that we're trying to love and touch for your power and your glory's sake, Lord. And God, what's of the flesh, let it be like water off a duck's back, Lord. And Lord, if I've said something that people disagree with, Lord, don't let us turn our back on each other. God, we need each other, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Have a good week. See you in church. Thanks for joining us. Night-night.